Good morning. Welcome to the first Engage Student Engagement Initiative. Our third president, Thomas Jefferson, said, the cornerstone of democracy rests on the foundation of an educated electorate. As some of you may know, on August 21st, 2015, Governor Rauner signed House Bill 4025 into law, requiring that Illinois high schools throughout the state add a civics component to their curriculum. This law comes at a time when our country state, county, and city are facing issues from growing our economy, to preserving our planet, to protecting us from crime at home and terrorists abroad, all while trying to allow us to live as freely as possible. On Tuesday, November 6th, our country will have an election where many candidates, including some who will be on the stage today, will ask voters for an opportunity to represent all of you when making important decisions at the federal, state, and local level. You might hear the term midterm when you hear these elections being discussed in the media because they are taking place in the middle of the president's four-year term. Although President Trump is not on the ballot, these elections are sometimes considered by many to be a measure of how much people approve of how the party in power is doing. At the national level, that party is the Republican Party. But in Illinois, our power at the state level is divided between a democratically, elect, democratically controlled state assembly and a Republican governor. Today during lunch period, students can meet with representatives from the League of Women Voters to vote in a mock election and to register to vote. Bring your iPad, photo ID, and social security number to register. Before we meet our candidates, I'd like to first call up Mary Ann Judar from the Citizen Advocacy Center, followed by Heidi Graham from the League of Women Voters, would like to share a few words about their organizations. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you to all the student organizers and the teacher organizers and the participants today. And a great special thanks to Jerry and all the hard work that she does to bring civic engagement alive to all the students at the school. So I want to tell you a little bit about what we do at Citizen Advocacy Center because we actually have programming for students and a lot of students don't know about us. What we are is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. Do you guys know what nonpartisan means? I hear some, I see some people scratching their heads. Nonpartisan means we don't have any political affiliation. In fact, uh, Folks from all over the political spectrum enjoy our services because what we focus on is the process of democracy and everyone's interested in maintaining the integrity of democracy, at least they hope so. Um, we're trying to make sure everyone's interested in that. Um, so this is what we do for students. Um, I'm going to name about five different general services that we do. So we do civic education like this. Um, we also do one-on-one -on -one civic education, so if students were to contact us over the phone, we'd love to talk to students to answer their questions about government, about the Constitution, about their rights at school or outside of school. We have all kinds of free resources on our website. I should say all of our services are free. Um, so our, our free resources on our website include citizen guides, and citizen with a small c, so not literally like a citizen of the United States, but a resident, somebody who lives in the United States who considers themselves to be an American. Um, so we have guides to help folks understand different government processes, a lot of them local, so municipal or county, but also statewide, and even a few resources on federal laws and programs. Um, we do advocacy for student journalism. So there's a great new law in, the, in Illinois from 2016. It was enacted. It's the Press Rights for Student Journalists Act, and it's restored First Amendment rights to student journalists in Illinois. That was taken away by the Supreme Court in this case called Hazelwood, which you guys might know about. Um, so because of that new law, there's a lot of education to be done to teach people and the administrations of these different schools that the First Amendment rights of students have been completely restored. So 
some of the advocacy around that when students contact us. We have internships. We have student internships uh, during the summer. We have them during the school year. We have high school internships, college internships, law school internships, and students are immersed in civics. So no one's fetching coffee. Um, no one is doing data entry. Maybe you know a little bit on one day if we have a project that involves data entry. Everyone gets their hands dirty. But generally, people are like really getting there. All the students are sinking their teeth into meaty civics issues and doing work that actually makes a difference that we use every day. And finally, we have, well, not finally, but ultimately maybe, we have a helpline. And so students can contact us on our phone from 9 to 5. We're open Monday to Friday. Um, students sometimes call us after school or if, they have, if they're allowed to use the cell phone at school, like in between classes or at lunchtime. And I'll give you some examples of how students contact us or like for what reasons they contact us. Um, well, yesterday I was at Donner's Grove South High School. They do a thing called Constitution Day, and they've done it for 30 years, where every, high, every sophomore comes through um, a room where we have a panel um, I'm on that panel, and we talk about students' constitutional rights in and out of school. So that includes the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment. Students have all kinds of questions about dress code and other school policies around security and, and discipline. Um, so really, it's, it's amazing. The, I, I, every year I hear new questions. Um, social media comes up a lot. Um, students might contact us because they want to organize a protest at their school. So maybe you guys remember the March for Our Lives. We got lots of questions from students around that and what they could do or couldn't do with or without consequences and kind of parsing out, um, you know, what their options are. And also, um, students have called us about protests that they wanted to organize, for example, um, in support for their fellow students who are DACA recipients. That was an example from Glenbard East High School. Um, and there's other protests where students have contacted us about that they would like to organize or that they did organize. And we basically help adults and students organize around issues that they care about. So in the school district setting, for example, parents and students may con might contact us if there's discussion in that district about, let's say, dividing um, a K through eight school into a middle school and an elementary school, and the community, community is against that. But the administration or the, the powers that be aren't listening to the community and they want to organize around that. So there's one example, but we do all kinds of organizing at all different levels of government, including some that you'll hear about today. So with that, um, if anyone has any questions, I can give a couple of minutes for questions. Well, again, thanks for having me. I'm really excited about today. I heard a lot about how um, you guys were prepared. So I'm excited to see what happens and what unfolds today. Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Still morning, I get it. Um, hi, my name is Heidi Graham. I'm a mom of two kids that are about your age. I have a daughter at Emerson College in Boston, and I have a son who's a sophomore at Prospect High School. And I'm also president of the local League of Women Voters. You may have seen us in your hallways registering voters. Today, again, we're helping with your mock elections. Or you've seen one of our vote stickers. Or you've gotten one of these, the vote is mightier than the pen, styluses. We give every student on their 18th birthday a present to encourage them to vote. So yeah, I think voting is pretty important. I mean, I'm, I'm a volunteer. I do this, I'm not getting paid. I uh, volunteer my time. And I put my money where my mouth is to live up to the league motto, which is we empower voters and we defend democracy. 
And that's women and men, old and young, and everyone in between. Which is why I guess I was asked to come and talk to you today about the importance of voting. So why should you vote? Now I started thinking about what I was like when I was your age, a thousand years ago, and what my reaction to a middle-aged white lady coming to talk to me about voting would be. Frankly, I'd be that person in the back corner, slumped, passing notes, because it was the days before cell phones, not that old. Um, and I would be passing notes talking about how lame and boring this old lady was. So I'm going to ask you that if you're tweeting about how lame and boring I am today, you at least tag us at LWBAHVG, um, because any publicity is good publicity, all right? <laughs> but I digress. Well, I, didn't, I decided that you didn't really need to listen to me about why you should vote. I know a lot of people your age. So I sent out a bunch of texts yesterday and I said, Okay, why do you vote? Why do you think it's important to vote? I'm really nervous. I gotta go talk to these students at Elk Grove High School. I'm afraid they're all gonna fall asleep. And this is some of the things that I got. The first text was from a young man who admitted to me that he had never voted before. And he said, personally, I find it hard to sift through biased info and make an objective, informed decision on who to vote for especially when there's so much drama and unnecessary noise coming from those running, you know, calling out politici other politicians rather than telling me what you'll do. With recent political changes, I think so many people want to disassociate from the government out of frustration. But this is the time we need to be present, especially young people, in the elections. We are shaping his future, our future. So absolutely, yes, voting shapes your future. But it can be overwhelming and daunting and confusing. And he realizes that it's important enough to take a little bit of time and be informed and vote, just like you're doing today by listening to these politicians come and talk to you about what they'll do for you. For you. And have I told you to follow us on social media yet? All right, follow us on social media. In fact, we have a, um, a dog mascot, Ferris Four Votes, F-E-R-R-I-S, the number four votes and that is on Instagram. That's my dog, he's really so cute. <clears throat> but the rest of the text that I received were all, yes, I vote and here is why. One person said, I think it's important as our civic duty. We're all lucky to live in a country with freedom of speech and many other liberties other people in the world aren't fortunate enough to have. So if the one thing that we have to do with, to keep it that way is to vote, well then it's well worth it. I can agree with that. <laughs> if I want to march this Saturday with the Women's March, I want that to be my protected right. And there are still places in the world where citizens don't have those same freedoms. A few people said they wanted to have representatives who share their same values. They said things like, I believe it's important to be part of the political process, and it's also important for me to put people in office who I think are going to do the best job and make progress on the issues I care about. Or there was this, voting is an important opportunity to be able to vocalize your beliefs. You can take it further by advocating or reaching out to your government officials, but voting is the bare minimum that I think should be done. The ability to vote is what sets the U.S. apart from so many other places. We have the freedom to participate to an extent in the government. And then this one, I vote because I want my representatives to value the same issues and concerns that I have as a citizen. I actually feel that most people in office don't, so I want to change that. I do know that through my work in league, our representatives actually do listen when we write, when we text, and when we tweet to them some more than others. And so I plan to make my choice on who I vote for based on how well I think they listen to me. In fact, I've personally had the opportunity to meet with each and every one of my representatives. And most are actually reasonable folks. The ones who aren't, well I promise you I'm gonna be voting a cat, I'm going to be casting a vote to remove them from office in a few weeks. One answer that I received from a young person was really quite forward thinking. I think that voting is important for young people in particular because the decisions being made now 
are going to affect us for our whole lives. Unlike older generations, we will deal with, and she's talking to me, older generations, we will deal with repercussions or enjoy the benefits of the decisions we make. And yes, in our state, we are absolutely having to deal with things that were put into action when I was born. That's a long time ago. That's right, the pension crisis you hear so much about, and if you haven't heard the pen about the pension crisis, you've had to have heard your parents complaining about their high taxes. Well, those are direct result of the pension crisis, and that pension crisis has been difficult to manage because of an ill-conceived clause in our 1972 Constitution. I was born in 1970. So yes, the decisions you make today when you vote by your representatives, they're going to affect you for a long time. And hopefully y'all are smarter than uh, people were in the 1970s. One text pointed to voting is helping them to be a better critical thinker and, thinker and problem solver. I think that by voting, you're exposing yourself to topics and educating yourself on issues, which makes you not only more knowledgeable about the world you live in, but also a better problem solver. Well, both of these skills are critical to being successful, period. And I love this reason that I got, because it was local and it was concrete. If you complain about hot potholes, then vote for someone who will, who will work to repair our streets. It's as simple as that. Much of what we vote on and about absolutely affects our everyday daily life, like potholes on our city streets. And as a military brat, my dad served in the Air Force for 24 years, I often get the following reason, but I love to hear that it came from someone half my age. I vote because it's important to exercise the right that others have fought for. It's important because it gives us a voice. My daughter's best friend, she texted this to me and it made me really proud because it proved that she was actually listening and not slumped in the back corner texting about how lame I am. She said, I vote because it is my civic duty and responsibility. By participating in the democratic system, I help to guarantee its ability to function as an institution. On a different level, I find voting to be very important, and I guess the reasoning I can give is that the enemy of justice is inaction, not injustice. So I think that it is important to participate if you want to live in a just society. I love that, because I want to live in a just society. And this brings me to my last response. One of my neighbors moved to Florida, and her children attend Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. As a mom, I cannot imagine what it was like to be a mother of children at that school, much less be a child or a student in that school or a teacher. It was the deadliest school shooting in history. Her daughter, who graduated from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School last year, this is her reason for voting. She said, I vote because I personally experienced, pardon me, a school shooting that killed 17 of my classmates and teachers. I understand the importance of local elections, like the school board, the governor, our state president, in a whole new way. I also vote because we live in a multicultural, multi-generational community. The elected officials need to better balance the diversity, the age, the gender, the color, the socioeconomic status of the people. So, I hope that one of these reasons resonates with you and sticks with you. And I hope that you don't. Thank you for having me.
some of these people are so important because when I was your age, I was probably sitting there just like you are, maybe listening, maybe half thinking about what I was going to do at the weekend. But I have some questions to ask you to hopefully get you guys thinking a little bit differently about something that may seem important. How many of you just can't wait to go speak publicly in the open world? Please raise your hand. Anybody? Oh, I see. Oh, I got awesome. How many of you are sitting at the edge of the, your seats because you just can't wait to put up a bunch of tacky yard signs? Come on, there's got to be a few. Oh, I see one. Thank you. Thank you. How many of you love to bar the living daylights out of your neighbors who want absolutely nothing to do with you? Try to arm them with some very important information about you. Some of you must be going to that. Anybody? How many of you live to call people that you don't know? To knock on doors only to be treated like an inconvenience and those are really nice. These are just some of the things that our candidates want. And here's what we'll ask. This is my absolute favorite. How many of you just chopping at the beat bit to learn about things like Waiting until 
you have a devastating problem in your own backyard, it's the wrong way to find out how important it is to pay attention to what's going on in your The candidates and elected officials you're about to hear are going to be making some of the most important decisions that will directly impact your quality of life and the quality of lives of your children. Today we have the honor and privilege of welcoming U.S. Congressman Rajna Krishnamurti to Elk Grove. He is one of 435 members of the United States House of Representatives. Congressman Krishnamurti represents the interests of our portion of Illinois. He was elected to represent Illinois' 8th Congressional District in 2016 and is serving his first term in the U.S. Congress. The son of Indian immigrants to the U.S., Congressman Krishnamurti grew up in Illinois and attended Princeton University, where he received a degree in engineering before going to Harvard University for his law degree. He's out there. He's going to be coming in shortly, I think. Um, due to demands on his time, the congressman cannot stay for our candidate forum today, but we have invited him to say a few words uh, for us today. Um, and on a timing note, during his, his talk to all of you, it may be the end of the period, and I know some of you weren't able to get permission from your teachers to stay for both. Um, but please wait until he's finished. He won't be marked after our party. So just wait until, until he's finished, and that'll be a good point at which we can change. Okay? Without further ado, Congressman Christian Morty. Good morning. Good morning. I 
uh, it's so nice to come someplace where they pronounce your name properly. <laughs> I, um, when I first ca campaigned for office, I said, hi, my name is Raja Krishnamurthy. And someone came up to me and said, Roger Christian Murphy. Very nice to meet you. I didn't know the Irish made it to India. And so it's so nice to be with you uh, all here at Elk Grove uh, High School. I want to say a special thank you to Jerry Songer for coordinating this event. Can you give her a round of applause? the Civic Advocacy Center, as well as the League of Women Voters. And I see my good friends, Representative Moylan and Mayor Johnson here. I see candidates as well. Uh, so it's so nice to be with all of you this morning. Um, I do want to observe those three rules of public speaking. Be short, be sweet, and be gone. And so I just have a few quick points that I want to make before you hear your next speaker. First of all, I want to thank um, all of you for uh, expressing interest in the subject matter today which is how do we increase civic participation? How do we make it more um, uh, the case that our public policy reflects your preferences and your opinions and what uh, needs to be done for your future? Um, as a member of Congress, I get to decide um, how I spend my time in representing this district. And one of the things that I have prioritized above all is civic, en civic engagement um, civic leadership and access to the ballot box, especially for young people. And in that vein, um, I partnered with a gentleman named Senator Cory Booker from New Jersey to introduce legislation called the Help Students Vote Act. This legislation updates an archaic provision of the Higher Education Act to ensure that all students, regardless of political affiliation, have the ability to vote. Now, you may already uh, be aware of this, but a very low percentage of people um, between the ages of 18 and 25 are registered to vote. Now only 42% of people in that age range are actually registered to vote. That means that 58% aren't. And so how do we change this? A, how do we get people registered to vote? And then B, how do we get them to vote? And so what uh, Senator Booker and I did uh, was the following. We made it clear that once you uh, reach the voting age and you're in college, that colleges do the following. First, they make it clear to you exactly when the voting registration deadlines are coming up and how do you register. And so uh, there is a, a provision of the Higher Education Act that requires colleges to inform students but it's not really enforced and it's outdated. So we just made a few quick revisions. First, we said that every college and university must send voter information to all students twice a year, at least 30 days before voter registration deadlines. Second, it requires every college to designate a voter a campus vote coordinator at every campus to make sure that if you have questions, someone is there to answer them. And third and finally, we allow for grants to recognize those colleges and universities that do an exemplary job of making it clear to their students how to vote and where to vote. Now this may seem um, mundane to you, but as you'll soon realize, when you leave high school and you go to a college, you may move to a new, uh, a new town, a new city, a new location, perhaps out of state, and you don't know exactly how to register to vote. And so what we're trying to do is to try to make it easier and try to get colleges and universities to actually inform you about how to do that. Now, I want to segue to my third and final point, which is something that I try to emphasize to all audiences, which is this. In Washington, D.C., there's an old adage, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. If you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. That means that if you don't have a, uh, a say in how decisions are made, 
about your future or about policies that concern you, you may very well be adversely affected. And that goes for young people. That goes for you. And so it's vitally important that you pull up that prover proverbial uh, seat at the table and have a say in the decisions that will affect your future. For instance, should we fight climate change and try to take care of the environment so the planet is there for you when you grow up and you raise your families? Should we make sure that when you want to go to college and university that you're not drowning in student debt, which a lot of your predecessors unfortunately are experiencing? Another question, um, should we pursue policies that welcome all people to this country, that treat everybody the same, regardless of where you come from, what language you speak at home, what religion you practice, whom you love, or how many letters there are in your name. There are 18 in mine. <coughs> These are the questions that you have to have a hand in answering. So I implore you, please, Demand a seat at the table. And if there aren't enough seats, we need to make a bigger table and make sure that you're there. And that starts with voting. That starts with engaging in the civic life of your country and making sure that your voice is heard. The last point related to that is, I hope that some of you will consider a career in public service. And if not a career, at least a season of public service helping your fellow man and woman, and helping your community, and perhaps some of you will, will even consider running for office. Maybe, like these candidates who are here today, maybe you'll run for city council. Maybe you'll run for state house. Maybe you'll run for state senate. Maybe even one or two of you will run for the United States Congress. Please don't run in my congressional district. <laughs> Anywhere else will be delighted. But the point is this, which is that I hope that you consider getting even more involved in the civic life uh, of this country because we need you now more than ever. The stakes could not be higher. And your voices are essential for formulating the right policies, not only that affect you, but affect the rest of our community and our country. So thank you so much. I close with my favorite saying, which is that yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. And so I'm honored and blessed to be with you here today to celebrate you, to celebrate your future, and to celebrate how after today you're going to get even more engaged in the public policy of our country and making sure that we have the right ones that affect you and the broader community. Thank you so much, and God bless.
leaving, so um, just to have more time with our candidates and more time for conversation, I'd like to keep going. Um, before we begin our forum, I'd like to welcome our guests and briefly explain the different candidates and officials we have here with us today. At the state level, we have Illinois State Representative Marty Moylan, who is running for re-election in our 55th district in our State House of Representatives in Springfield. If elected, he will continue to be one of the 118 members in the Illinois House of Representatives in Springfield, Illinois, and represent our part of the state. State Representative Moylan has more than 40 years of experience in the construction industry, specializing in the electrical field. As the former electrical inspector and deputy director of the Displays Building Department, Moylan has helped transform the department into a user-friendly agency. As state representative, Moylan works on issues affecting the families of the 55th District. He currently serves on the cities and villages, economic development, regulations and roads, and transportation, vehicles, and safety committees. He is also the proud father of a Maine West Township High School graduate. Representative Moylan. At the local level, we also have members and candidates for the Cook County Board of Commissioners. If elected, they will be one of 17 commissioners that represent our area of Cook County on things such as property taxes, roads, judges, voting, parks and forest preserves, hospitals, and a variety of other local services. Although we probably know less about the Cook County Board of Commissioners than we do other levels of government, the things they do and issues they face play a huge role in our lives. Mr. Kevin Morrison, a candidate for the Cook County Commissioner, District 15, has served constituents as an intern and community organizer. Raised in Elk Grove Village, Kevin attended Link, Mead, and Conan High Schools. His grandparents were Italian immigrants who realized the American dream, and the restaurant his family built recently celebrated its 49th anniversary. He believes pro-business policies like a fair tax system and small business incentives that helped his grandparents get started should be refined and strengthened so that they can continue to do the same for future generations. <laughs> Mr. Abdel Nasser Rashid is an independent Democrat running for Cook County Commissioner in the 17th District because working and middle class families continue to face growing hardships and high property taxes. Abdel Nasser's parents traveled to America 52 years ago from a rural village where educational opportunities were scarce, especially for women. They were among the first in their village to send their daughters to college. Abdel Nasser grew up helping his mother run a booth at the local flea market, and his father operate a small retail business in Chicago. Also serving our immediate community is the mayor of Elk Grove, Craig Johnson. In 2011, Johnson pondered running in the Republican primary for the open 8th Congressional District seat at the urging of a prominent political and business figures, but eventually decided against it. He's also passed on opportunities to seek state office. Johnson was appointed by Governor Bruce Rauner to the Illinois Tollway Board of Directors. He has long served as chairman of the Suburban O'Hare Commission, an anti-noise advocacy group. He is not the mayor of this song or who he, she was referring to earlier. <laughs> Thank you, candidates and elected officials, for taking the time to be with us here today. Today, we also have the good fortune of having four Elk Grove debaters, Jared Waller, Daniel Salgado Alvarez, Nicola Sawa, and Amelia Gibbs to ask questions of our candidates. Follow-up questions will also be asked by our moderator, Chuck Keeshan, who is a reporter from the Daily Herald. The questions that will be asked have been written entirely by students. If you have a question you'd like to be asked, please write it on a note card that I'll have and be walking around with and pass it towards the center aisle. Please refrain from packing up getting out cell phones or talking with friends until the panel discussion has officially ended. Our student moderators know exactly when their period will end and they will let you know. And with that, we will begin.
question is, what tissues are your top priority? Everyone speak first. So I guess I will start. Hi guys, I'm Kevin Morrison. Uh, what a great opportunity you guys have uh, to sit here today and get to see some candidates who are going to be on the ballot this uh, November 6th. Well, uh, except for the mayor. This will be at the municipals. Uh, I, I'm Kevin Morrison. I grew up in Elk Grove Village. Uh, unfortunately, a uh, Conan High School grad over here. Uh, but uh, I, the district that I'm representing encompasses most of Elk Grove Village, uh, a good chunk of Elk Grove Township, Schaumburg Township, Hanover, Barrington. Um, as commissioner, one of the main reasons why I decided to run is I want to see policies that uplift middle class families and make sure that when you guys graduate high school and if you decide to uh, go right into the workforce or continue on to college, that you have better opportunities here in Cook County moving forward. Um, I want to see policies that help uh, promote small business growth and help uh, uh, develop uh, and grow our local economies. Uh, but I also want to see growth in affordable health care access here in the northwest suburbs, uh, making sure that we are bringing more affordable options and also increasing mental health access. Um, but most of all, I, I want to see policies that allow um, for the American dream to continue for our families, to allow uh, people the opportunity to have that opportunity to keep moving up the economic ladder and have uh, more and more access to growth to support their friends and families. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to the organizers for putting on such a fantastic forum um, and for the great questions. I really do hope some of you guys run for office. Um, I have 17 letters in my name, not 18, so you beat me by one. Um, so my, uh, you know, I think as Kevin was saying, for me, one of the most important things um, that I see in my district, my district goes all the way from Tinley Park and Orland Park up to the Splains and includes a small part of Elk Grove Village. Uh, people are talking about forced property taxes, right? Um, we have an assessment system. Um, I won't get too much into the weeds, but there's a when when the assessor in Cook County tells you how much the value of properties are, what we're doing is we're giving huge tax reductions to the downtown uh, commercial properties, like the Sears Tower, Trump Tower. They're getting huge reductions in their taxes because we're under assessing them, and on the flip side, we're over assessing. Uh, middle-class homes and small businesses and so they're paying more than they should um, so one of the things that we need to do is make sure our property tax system is fair that's my main priority we also have to make sure that our health and hospital system is funded so that we have the services we need to be able to address um, you know a range of issues including mental health issues and the opioid epidemic uh, and in my district we're also um, pretty seriously impacted by some of you may have heard of the sterogenics plant in Willowbrook that's um, releasing this cancer-causing gas into, into the air that people in that area are breathing. It's called ethylene oxide. It's a very, serious, a very uh, highly carcinogenic gas. And people in uh, LaGrange, in Burr Ridge, in Hinsdale, Brookfield, etc., um, and of course in parts of DuPage County where this is uh, happening, are, are exposed to cancer at an astonishing uh, rate. And so um, my one of my priorities right now, before I even get into office, is for us to shut down the sterogenics plant um, so that people's uh, health is ahead of the uh, corporate profits. Hey, I'm Marty Moylan, and I'm happy to be here. You know where we're at? One of the top high schools in the whole district. Certainly the brightest and smartest students. So one of the big things I'm working on is helping you guys get to college. So in our budget, we passed back grants to try and give us some uh, financial stability. The current administration in Washington says, ah, you know, we like education, but that's not our top priority. Um, also, if we talk about numbers of letters in your family, I have 12 <laughs> brothers and sisters, so that's 13. Two parents, that's 15. Two dogs, when we were growing up. How many is that, guys? Because we got the smartest class here. 16? A cat, 17, and all our neighbors came and played at our house. That's like 27. But anyways, listen guys, we're looking for a lively debate, and I'm happy and proud to be here. And I've been to many of your houses, talking to your parents, passing out dog treats, fingernail files, and listening to what's happening in your community. Well, thank you for uh, having me here. You may not know this, but 40 years ago, yes, four zero years ago, I graduated from Oak High School. Uh, I was born and raised here in Elk Grove. Jackson 
last few years, I had wrestling coach here at the high school. But all my kids grew up in Elk Grove, graduated from Elk Grove High School, and now my grandkids growing up here in Elk Grove. What I want to talk about real quickly here from the introduction is, yes, you watch TV sometimes, you want to solve the Judge Kavanaugh hearings, or you see what's going on in Washington, and sometimes in Springfield, Marty's got to put up with. It seems very dysfunctional. But what I want to talk to you briefly about is your local government. Do you realize that there's no government branch that affects you more than your local government? Every road you ride on was built by your village. Every time you get water out of your sink, it's from your village. Every time you turn your light on, we have to oversee to make sure it's there for you by your village. We affect your lives 24-7. Bills the governor signs may affect you one out of a thousand. Bills the president may sign may affect you one out of a million. Everything I sign affects you every single day. Yet, here's the ironic thing. When there's a presidential election, about 60 to 80 percent of the people vote. When there's a governor's election coming up, about 30 to 50 percent vote. When there's a local election coming up, we're happy if we get five percent of the people vote. It doesn't make sense. We affect you all the time. So please, this is a great forum. This is a great opportunity for you to get involved. Be part of the process. Don't be like so many people who just sit back and complain. Make a change. If you get as frustrated with government as I do on the inside of government, get involved in changing. That's what we're going to do with you. That's what we want you to do. And that's why we're here today to help you understand what's going on. And hopefully someday you'll be sitting up here making decisions. And hopefully we get rid of the dysfunction we see in government and we get a functioning way it should be. As I mentioned earlier, we had finally passed a, a budget, a bipartisan budget last year that included MAP grants to help students go to college. Uh, when we had an administration that wouldn't pass a budget for three years and tried to shrink the size of government, shrink the size of universities, we had a constant battle. We believe in working together, hashing things out, but most importantly, schools, uh, schools and college education are one of the most important issues that we can face. Uh, I call this thing called everybody, every nationality is uh, turning the box. When my grandparents all came here, uh, they had to work hard. Uh, they started in the, a lower rung of a facility or a factory and worked their way up. That's what all the nationalities, all these, uh, all my relatives all do. You got to help them. You got to educate them. Uh, education is one of our top priorities, and myself as a state representative, that's what I thrive to do. Yes. To follow up on that. Yes. Um, in part because of the lack of financial aid that you can see, right. more and more Illinois students are leaving the state for higher education. Right. What, um, as a legislator, can you do to uh, turn well, that around? Here, um, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, we proposed a 3% millionaire's tax, and all that money would go to education. Uh, as you know, uh, Washington, not uh, not Raja, but people in Washington are trying to shrink the size of our budget. So we're looking for the state to get more. So I would propose, uh, uh, it's called the millionaire's tax. 3% of everybody making a million dollars will go right to education funding. So our next question will be going to our county candidates, Rasheed and Morrison, as well as our mayor, Tech Johnson. Uh, Unincorporated areas in our community, such as low homes that are a high population of our own school populace, lack access to public services such as city water and libraries. And I was wondering, do you support integrating unincorporated areas under county jurisdiction or under municipal responsibility? Uh, so, uh, I spend a lot of my time throughout the week knocking doors and talking to people. Uh, I've walked all over Elk Grove Township and I've spoken uh, with residents in both Elk Grove uh, uh, Township and living in the unincorporated parcels and the people who are uh, part of incorporated uh, Elk Grove Village. Now, a top concern as I'm going door to door tend to be most specifically uh, how high property taxes are, uh, be it 
uh, the ability to find affordable health care access. Uh, a lot of the issues that we're hearing about door to door are not whether or not to incorporate the unincorporated parcels that uh, are in the township. Now, it is our county government that deals with unincorporated um, parcels throughout Cook County. And I would work firsthand with our constituents and make sure that they have their voices heard in what, what the future of their localities look like. We need to make sure, of course, we have uh, the public's uh, wants and needs always at heart, and I think that's incredibly important in representation. It's one of the reasons why I decided to run for this seat. You know, you, we need to make sure we have elected officials who actually care about the constituents within their district. Um, and so I think that making sure that we're always having a coordinated effort to talk to the people who do live in unincorporated and in, in incorporated areas um, always have their voices heard, but of course we need to make sure that everyone has access uh, to the services that you know people who do live in these incorporated areas have. We need, I think it's incredibly important that we do bring about um, uh, communities that have safe drinking water. You know, even in incorporated areas, uh, there are still high amounts of lead. Uh, I don't know if that, any of you read the report last year about lead in the drinking water in Chicago, but. Um, there's an incredible negative health ramifications of drinking lead in your water. Uh, and that happens in both incorporated and in unincorporated areas. So I think as elected officials, we need to do more that the public is always safe and that when you turn on that faucet and uh, uh, pour a glass of water, it is safe for you and your family to consume. So I, I believe it's important for um, residents in unincorporated areas to have access to services, whether it's safe water, whether it's library access, um, and other services that they need to be able to uh, you know, get get the services um, to to live uh, you know their, their best lives. And I think that that needs to be a conversation with the municipalities and with the county. Um, municip some municipalities may resist because there are costs associated, of course, with providing these services. And so the county is in a position to work with municipalities, perhaps provide some incentives so that they can incorporate some of the areas. There is no one size fits all for every incorporated area. There are many of them throughout the county. My district has a large number of unincorporated residents. I think it really needs to be a conversation with those residents and with the municipalities. And where we can, we should uh, have them incorporate. It does lead to better local governance, and they have a say then in their local government. They get to vote for those um, uh, for those uh, representatives at the local level, um, and it also means that they um, will also pay for a, a portion of what the services that they're getting. So it really does need to be a conversation. This isn't something that we can force on either the residents in unincorporated areas or on the municipalities. New Canada was very impressed. They were very, I'm serious, they were very stupid answer that you, uh, you provided. I'm serious, that was, that was excellent. I've been mayor for 22 years. Uh, the unincorporated areas have been an issue for my community, displays and Mount Prospect. For my 22 years mayor, provide for 50 years beyond that. A couple things happen on this. It's really somewhat out of our hands. If you're over 60 acres in size, a town cannot force you to join another community. They have to voluntarily want it. The owner of those trailer parks have no desire, no wanting to come into a town. There have been discussions in the past, not that long ago. Obviously, our town was part of it. Um, the reason they don't want to is that they have to fulfill and follow the rules of the municipality they go into. So they come in out go, they have to follow all those rules. Um, prospect, same thing, display, the same thing. There's also a lot of costs, it was said in there. Well water around here has a lot of issues. That's why most towns around here have Lake Michigan water. It's been a lot of money bringing it out here. It's far better quality water. It doesn't have quite the impact from land above, uses from factories and rest, that potentially can pollute it and cause problems. Um, that's an expensive cost to bring that into the trailer parks and get them updated. Same thing with infrastructure, roadways in the trailer parks, sidewalks in the trailer parks, lighting in the trailer parks. It all costs money. And remember, the people in each town, on Prospect Displays Elk Road, paid for the lights that are here at Elk Road, paid for the water to come to Elk Road, paid for the sidewalks, paid for the streets. Can those people in that area afford to pay for those upgrades in their, their area? Maybe, maybe not. I like hearing about a potential partnership with the county 
if that were to happen, to help make the cost more affordable for the towns. It's definitely something that should be talked about. It has been talked about in the past. Right now, the biggest fear we have is the owners of these trailer parks have no desire whatsoever to come into a town. It needs to start with them. Then we're all willing to work with them from that point on. Again, this is Marty Moylan. I've been battling the Zeman owners of these uh, mobile home parks since I was mayor. I have eight mobile home parks in my district. Two of them have over uh, 1,500 uh, residents, sometimes as up to 2,000. We passed the Springfield first mobile home park bill of rights. We had the biggest protest in mobile home park history right in front of their uh, facility, forcing them to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in improvements. Uh, they would go around giving poor residents tickets they played in their streets, if they parked their car wrong, and then they would say, if you don't pay them, we're going to give you a five-day notice. We, we stopped all that. We called the, the uh, because they don't have regular police like in local village and Plains Police State and unincorporated, they have the sheriff. We called them, we had a big meeting with the police departments, and then we got the manager fired. So when we saw a wrong, we corrected it. When I was mayor, we had control of them in the Plains, but unincorporated area, we have the Oasis and two other huge uh, mobile home parks, uh, they are underserved uh, because of the previous commissioners. Uh, because in mobile home parks, residents generally don't vote. Voting is power. If you're in a mobile home park, sometimes they're uh, uh, working two jobs for minimum wage, uh, they're cash cows for the owners. So we really, really got involved and we made a lot of these owners spend money, money uh, which they should have a long time ago. But remember, these are cash cows for the owners. The Zeman brothers own all these. They're multi-millionaires, and they keep ripping off the poor residents. So we put a stop to most of it. But I think Fred for what he's trying to do. Now you talk about the library. They're, because they're in, unincorporated, they weren't able to use the library. So we made an exception, and now they're able to use the Splains Library. Because I think that we should, again, educate people, help them move up the chain, and let them get jobs, good paying jobs, instead of working two or three minimum wage jobs. And I also support a living wage. Stop this BS of paying seven, eight dollars an hour. They should make fifteen dollars immediately, not twenty twenty, right now. problem this country facing is the opioid crisis. Don't anybody kid you. It's the biggest problem we're facing. A little over two years ago, I was at one of our summer concerts. And uh, represented part of the loves. And we all love it. I'll go over here. Um, I was standing there, and a gentleman with me, one of our village uh, officials, goes, Mayor, you recognize that man walking toward us? And what? Do you recognize that young man walking toward us? I'm staring, I'm staring. I saw an old guy walking toward me. When he got right in front of me, he was one of my former wrestlers here at Oak Grove High School. He looked like he was 50 years old. I look at the gentleman with me and he goes, Mayor, that's what heroin does to you. He was 21 years old. He was a stud when he was here at Oak Grove. I wouldn't even practice against him. That is what happens with this problem. I went to the new police chief within a week and I said, you've got one job ahead of you, and that is we have to develop a program to address this issue. It took us two years, two years of work, because it's a problem that everyone's trying to address and no one seems to have an answer. We not only look locally, we look nationally for answers. And we came up with a solution that so far has been effective. Number one, we call it Elko Village Cares. And under Elko Village Cares, there's three things there. One is recovery. Addiction is a disease. It's a disease. No different than cancer, no different than heart disease. It's a disease. You all probably know someone that's had cancer. 
But when you find out, it's heartbreaking. But the first thing that happens is you bring them dinner, you offer to drive them for chemotherapy, you offer to cut the grass, anything to help them battle the disease. When I had bypass surgery four years ago, I got people sending over fruit baskets. Can I drive you somewhere, Mayor? Can I help you? It was heart disease. When people get addiction, I'll go, whoa, whoa, whoa. We can't, we can't talk to you. You're a pariah. You got, you got leprosy. Get away from us. That's wrong. Addiction is a disease as anything else. We need to be there to help them. So recovery is the first thing. Recovery for the addict, recovery for the family that's fighting with the addict to beat this disease. Second is commitment. The village is committed. We put a half a million dollars to start this program. We work with our state rep, Marta Moylan, state rep Musman, Kajra Raja, who just left, asked me again about it. We work with him to get more funds to make this very happen and get better. But the biggest component we have to overcome is compassion. We need to get our community and everyone's community behind this battle of addiction. We need to work together as we did to fight cancer, as we did to fight heart disease. We need to fight this disease. And by joining together, we can make it happen. If you know someone, or if you have an addiction problem, you reach out to us. We're not there to put a handcuff on you. We're there to give you a hand up. We're going to help you get the help you need. Whether you have insurance or not, whether you live in Oakville Village or not, you come to us, we will help you. We will get you in a place for recovery, to go through treatment. If you don't have any financial means, we will pay for it. And you follow the process, and we will help you through the process. We will stay there with you the entire way. From the time you call us or reach out to us until you're fully recovered, we will be there with you as a team. We are going to beat this. And for those folks out there saying, well, I don't want to deal with addiction. It, I don't know anybody that's addicted. It doesn't bother me. It does bother you. Because if you know someone that's had your car broken into, if you know someone's had their house broken into, the vast majority of those are by addicts who are looking for a quick way to get money to get their next fix. Because that's all they live for is the next fix. So you may not like addicts. You may think it's their own fault. But it's affecting you anyways because you know someone where you may have been robbed, your house may have been burglarized. So this is the number one problem facing not only Oak Grove Village, not only the state of Illinois, but this country, this world. We need to work together as a team. We're going to beat this if we're beating cancer, if we're beating heart disease, if we're beating any other disease. And it will make the world better off. So I ask you, I plead with you. Work with us in Elk Grove Cares. We're here to help you, not arrest you. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to follow up. Um, Elk Grove Cares is obviously a great program um, and important and necessary. Um, but much of it is geared towards dealing with situations after somebody's already become addicted. What can government do at any level, and any of you can address this? to stop people from using the first place. If I can. You're exactly right. You know where people used to get addiction, or opioids and all that? It was from the doctor. Talking to the guy that's had surgeries, shoulder surgeries, everything else, and what's the first thing the doctor gives you? is pain pills. And what do you want to do? You just want to feel better. You can't blame doctors totally for this problem. Back 20 years ago, they were saying they were under-treating people for pain. That's when they started ratcheting it up, giving out opioids. So, that was the source of a lot of people's addiction. Now, to the credit, with publicity and all the rest, it started to be reduced with doctors. There are laws coming in, stronger enforcement, better checking and stuff. But these opioid people aren't stupid. You know where they're getting them from now? As doctors get tougher and tougher to get them from? They're going to dentists. With doctor, I had a tooth a canal two years ago and still bothered me. I need something. Dentists weren't thinking of connection between hooked on opioids and what they have for the root canal. So they started going to the dentist now. So now we're cracking that. But the biggest thing we need to do is to crack down on the source of the opioids. Not just the doctors, not just the dentists, but the manufacturers of these drugs. 
You need to crack down on how they're distributed, how they're made, and the formula they use that creates the addiction in the pills themselves. There's ways around it for pain killing that does not become so addictive. We need to work harder and stronger on that. So we need to start at the source, and we need to help those that are addicted to it. But the biggest problem we're facing, whether it's the source or the addiction, is we've got to work together to beat this disease. I cannot stress that enough. That's the problem we have. No one's willing to step up and address this disease. Thank you. If I may just add, so I, I completely agree with the mayor that overprescription is one major cause of this and that the state government and federal government need to um, uh, address this issue to make sure that doctors, dentists, anyone who's, who's prescribing um, opioid pain, uh, painkillers uh, is doing so in a responsible way that it's tracked that there you know there are, there are a number of ways there are ways where you can um, deal with people's pain without also uh, in basically encouraging them to become uh, addicts the uh, you know and then the, the manufacturers are absolutely a, a key part of this as well there was a great NPR segment on one of the key manufacturers that lied to the FDA for years and lied to the public and lied to doctors to encourage them to continue prescribing this, and only recently this was all uncovered after the Justice Department did an investigation, and so we absolutely have to hold the pharmaceutical companies accountable as well. And if I may, uh, I, I think there's three more points that should be uh, discussed, and yes, I, I completely agree with everything the mayor has uh, said about holding manufacturers accountable, uh, but first and foremost, I think that we need to change uh, for one, the education and the stigma on mental health disorder in our communities. Now, a lot of people who do become addicts uh, are trying to fill a void. So there's something that's scarring them in their past uh, that pushes them down this road. And without having access to affordable uh, mental health care, uh, I fear that this is going to be an issue that will only continue uh, moving forward. So first and foremost, we need to work with our communities to get rid of the stigma of those who are dealing with mental health issues. Because uh, as the, uh, the mayor said, uh, when someone has cancer, uh, you're there for their every want and need. You want to help them get better. But when someone is an addict or has a mental health issue, they become a pariah. When someone has a felony, they become a pariah. You know, we place so much stigma uh, on a certain group of people instead of working with them to get them better with whatever issue they're dealing with, which only pushes them down that same rabbit hole and down a path of self-destruction. So first and foremost, we need to deal with our communities, educate, and help get rid of the stigma of those who are dealing with addiction and mental health issues. Secondly, I think that we should be pushing forward policies uh, uh, on the government level that expand access to affordable mental health uh, health care. Now, in Cook County, Cook County Jail is one of the largest providers of mental health services in the entire United States. That's the Cook County Jail. It's a jail. It's not a mental health care facility. It is a jail. So we have people suffering from mental illness who are being pushed into the prison system because there is not adequate mental health services here on the ground. That needs to be addressed we need to make sure that those become available. Uh, we should not be imprisoning uh, people who are just solely dealing with mental health issues. And then also, we, we need to make sure that we're taking a tough look at um, how we talk with one another. When you're dealing with an issue, we need to make sure that we're able to feel confident in uh, being able to open up about those problems that we're dealing with. And so just making sure that you, know, you are talking to your friends and asking them, you know, are they dealing with an issue? Now, I, a lot of times when you ask, is you can probably read it. Your friend has a problem, right? Um, you know, they seem a little depressed as he's off. Uh, and you read it, and usually the first time you ask them, they're going to say, no, no, I'm okay. You know, uh, I've just had a bad morning. But you, you know they're not being completely honest. You need to make them feel confident that they can open up with you. Because without helping them fact and get uh, to the root of the issue that they're dealing with. They just keep that inside. It does push you uh, toward a, a, a more um, a poor path.
And so just making sure that you're able to uh, always be able to share in confidence with your friends and know that if you're dealing with an issue, you need to reach out to someone. It's okay, someone has probably dealt with the same thing you're dealing with today and making sure that you, you find that person that you can confide in and help deal with that problem. It, it's incredibly important and will help not lead you on a path of addiction. Question is for State Representative Marty Boylan. What legislation would you support or sponsor to protect against potential imminent throttling resulting from the FCC's decision in that well, well, look what happened. Uh, President Trump, who's on the side of big business, always tries to screw us by having uh, 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 these laws and all this stuff packed where if you use your internet and use it, it's going to cost you more and they're going to slow it down. Forget about that. We're going to pass legislation. I'm for net neutrality because we're all using more and more devices and we shouldn't have to pay for bureaucrats in Washington that are taking the size of big corporations or poor working class, middle class families. Kids, it's time to stand up. Don't let the bureaucrats in Washington take away your rights or charge them more or slow down your internet. It's a bunch of crap. Um, one of the, this question is directed to all of you. Um, please describe the importance of voting and civic engagement. Why is it important for students to get involved? So, first and foremost, it is so incredibly important to get involved. Uh, mind you, so many people died to help increase uh, voting rights throughout the nation, and you may have uh, seen, first and uh, foremost, that there are states that are trying to impede the rights of citizens to actually be able to cast their ballots uh, at the voting box. Now, we're very lucky in Illinois. If you are 18 years old and you are a non-registered voter, if you show up at your polling location on election day, you can register to vote. That is a reality in Illinois, but that is not the case in so many other states. Now, it is not hard to fall on the path that we have been seeing in a lot of states that are disenfranchising voters. So we need to make sure that we are electing people here in Illinois that are going to always stand up for our voting rights. Now secondly, uh, a lot of you are probably thinking about college or work. Uh, I would all hope that you guys will look and try to find a candidate. Uh, we've got now 26 days till election day. Now if you guys are looking to spice up your resumes, get involved with a local campaign. Now, go knock some doors, make some phone calls. I tell you, you put campaign experience on any resume, it's gonna help you in the future. Because first and foremost, you're proving to them that you have the ability to talk to others. That's incredibly important in almost every single job you're gonna ever apply for. Uh, and also, it feels good. And it feels good when you are giving back to your community. Now, uh, as the congressman said uh, earlier on today, I, I know maybe some of you weren't in the room, um, our younger age brackets of voters between the ages of 18 and 25 have one of the lowest rates of actually going out to the polls and voting. We have such a huge voice as youth. Now mind you, me and uh, Abdul Nasser Rashid right here, though we're not running against each other, hopefully we'll be joining each other on the Cook County Board, we would be two of the youngest uh, Cook County Board Commissioners ever elected to the Cook County Board. Uh, I'm 28 years old, he is 29. That's right, okay. yeah. Awesome. Uh, now we need more youth elected to office. Uh, because for one, they're bringing a better perspective uh, and something different than we see uh, usually. However, they, they can kind of relate a little bit to what you're going through, you know? Uh, some of you in this room right now, 10 years from now, if you're seniors, you might be running for county commissioner one day. I, I'm just having my 10 year anniversary from graduating from high school. But being involved locally is so incredibly important. So many people fought for us to have a voice. Uh, and we need to make sure it is heard because as the mayor said earlier, local government is so incredibly vitally important. And we have so low voter participation in our municipal governments that you know, go forward and elect responsible mayors who you know, help uh, increase uh, jobs and well-being here in our outdoor community. But, the only way we can do that is if we all get together and make sure that the best person is always getting in front of you. And I want to leave you with one last point. Primaries. Okay? Primaries are when you actually get the largest uh, voice, right? Now we have some of the lowest 
uh, voter participation in primaries. Uh, however, it is during the primary where you're actually choosing the candidate who may eventually take that seat. Because it's the general election where you only have one choice per party to uh, actually choose which candidate will actually take the seat after the election. But it's in the primary where you get to choose the most responsible uh, of the individuals who are actually going to be on that ballot. You know, I, I'm sure you've heard your parents say a lot, uh, oh, well, I, you know, uh, I, I'm voting for the last of two evils. Well, how could you vote for the last of two evils? Participate in primaries and make sure that you're not voting for any evil person to move forward and be on that ballot in the general. And then we can help deal with that situation. Thank you. The congressman did a pretty good job of explaining some of the very real ways that public policy impacts your lives every day. I know sometimes it's easy to be a little disconnected from that when you're when you're a teenager and not realize uh, you know, just how much the decisions people make in, in D.C. and Springfield and the county affect us. Um, student debt is, a, is an obvious one, but also you all know my, you all might know someone who has DACA or who's undocumented, right? You all. Um, know people who can't afford health care, you know people who are dealing with addictions, you know, then that can go on and on. And these are decisions that we're making, that people are making for us every single day at every level of government. And if people under 35 or people under 25 were to go out and vote, we'd have a entirely different set of elected officials. Take a look at the numbers. Um, in Washington and in Springfield, we would have people who are actually championing um, middle class families and the issues that we care about and we'd have different policies we wouldn't be talking about um, you know whether the minimum wage uh, should stay eight something an hour it's ridiculous you know I mean why aren't we already at 15 an hour why don't we have universal health care in this country why don't we have comprehensive immigration reform and we can go on and on that the answer to this question it really could come down to if people under 35 vote and I know 35 might seem like a long uh, time away, but we're talking about a few millions and millions of people, hundreds of thousands here in Cook County, who would literally change the course of our country, or of our state, or our county, if we go out to vote. Uh, it impacts you. Now you're going to start realizing it a little more as you enter college, as you start thinking about student debt, as you start facing issues as adults. Um, but, uh, and so I encourage you to tell every single person you know who's, who's going to be 18 by November 6th to register to vote. Like Kevin said, you can register even on election day, but don't wait. Go today, register to vote online if you, uh, if you aren't already. Um, get involved in a campaign. One of, both of us cover parts of this area. I go up to displays. I've got uh, David here, who's a, my, a field organizer on my staff, would be happy to have you um, uh, volunteer out of our displays office. And get involved in these campaigns, and let's together we really can change the, the direction of our country. And it, it doesn't have to take decades; it really doesn't. I was sitting in a classroom just like this, St. Phillips High School, right around 1966. Outside the classroom, the world was ablaze. Vietnam was raging. President Kennedy got shot, Bobby Kennedy got shot, Martin Luther got shot. I said, what the heck is going on? I went to the uh, University of Illinois in Ch Chicago Circle. Uh, they had the police riots at the Demo uh, Democratic National Convention. I said, man, something's got to change. Kids were going off, we were sitting in a room just like this. A third of the students were going off the, the water. Some of their brothers were already in Vietnam, coming back in body bags. They had the riots again in Chicago. And I said, that's it. I got to make a difference. I got to change. I got to get involved. So I became the youngest precinct captain in our district, working on the 37th Ward in the city of Chicago. Uh, from then on, like I said, just like you guys, while the world was ablaze, I was trying to make a difference at a early age. Uh, I moved out here. I ran politics in Chicago for a long time. I moved to Des Plaines in 1976. I ran all the matter elections, uh, uh, Senate elections, presidential elections. Then I ran for alderman. The first time I ran, I lost, but didn't get discouraged. I ran again, won, then I ran for mayor, and now state rep. But I was in a room just like this. Imagine outside the tanks are rolling down North Avenue. After I worked at, uh, after I got done with school, uh, 
I had a part-time job at Clark Gas Station from 3 to 11. Down North Avenue, we had trucks rolling down the street with tanks on the back of them, armed, armored carrier uh, vehicles, bringing the National Guard to quell the riots. As I said, that was the 60s and 70s. That's when I got involved. And, you know, they say one man can't make a difference. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, one person can make a difference, and it's up to every one of you. I know you got a lot going on, you're worried about college. If you're not going to college, why don't you go try and get a, a technical job? Uh, Craig's, Craig, Mayor Johnson's got a great uh, uh, technical area right here, an industrial complex, uh, where people that don't go to college can go can get a job. But what I'm saying is you got a lot on your mind. Uh, these video games and all the other outside uh, stuff that gets you distracted. But imagine being a, a student in the 60s and, and 70s, thinking that your next step may be to get drafted or have to join the military and go to Vietnam. That's when I decided that I'm going to make a difference. And I followed through with that to this day. Joe and Marty, if you combine their two ages, I'm still old in the two of them. Uh, I don't feel that old. Um, but when I first got elected to the village board here in Elk Grove, I was 33 years old. When I became mayor at age 37, I was the youngest mayor north of Springfield, Illinois, in the state of Illinois. You can get involved. You can be part of it. And voting's made easier today. We have a thing called early voting. Starting October 22nd, and every day, including Saturday and Sunday, until the day before November 6th election, you can go to the village hall and vote. So no, people have no longer the excuse, well, I have to work that day, I had to work overtime that day. You can vote starting Monday, October 22nd, every single day through November 6th. No excuse to not to do it. You need to be involved. And the good news about my position is, no offense to my friends up here, we're not partisan. We're not Republicans. We're not Democrats. We're not partisan. Maybe that's why we get things done. <laughs> Your streets are plowed. Your new roads right out there is being put in as we speak today. We get things done. No offense, but maybe if Washington and Springfield if it became more nonpartisan, we might get a lot more done in this whole country and make it a lot better. But that will only happen if you get involved. Get your voices heard. Let them know you're tired of all that crap going on. You want to work together as a team. We can agree to disagree, but we don't have to be disagreeable. So let's work together, get things done, and make a difference. what you post on Facebook. Uh, I would say study, uh, try to learn as much as possible, uh, do your research, be nice to your teachers and your parents, try to stay out of trouble, but uh, you know, whenever you have a goal, whatever you feel your path is, do whatever you can to follow it. Because if you do, you will get to that end goal. Uh, so just never have doubt in yourself and always believe you can achieve whatever you say your, uh, your heart is. So get involved today. Um, pick a campaign that you particularly care about, a candidate who you support, um, and go knock on doors, make phone calls, help them in whatever way they can. Uh, you, you're able to. Um, and run for office. Look at it. You know what? 19, 20 is not too young to run for park district, school board, library board, local trustee. There are there are young people in some of these positions. We need more. Look at those positions. It'll. There's nothing. Uh, more effective um, at teaching you what your local governments do and how they operate than actually going in and getting involved. Go to village uh, hall meetings, go to park district meetings, school board meetings, um, and then and just jump right in. Don't wait. Uh, get involved in the campaign. I have a lot of young people on my staff uh, working on our campaign. Uh, then to see if you like the business. And also get a cause. See something that you really think should be changed. Something in your community, something uh, that is affecting you and your family, and follow through with that cause. Walk, 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 and talk to your neighbors. Try and get public opinion on your side. I remember at uh, our library in Spain, before I was an alderman, uh, there's an issue that was affecting.
impact on our community. So I need to say, oh, uh, nothing can be done. I rallied the community, rallied supporters, and I changed the uh, public body's opinion, and we changed the philosophy. So that's why I'm saying, get involved early, get an issue, and go forward. Getting involved in public office, it's a lot of work. And this is what I said before, Facebook can really make your days long and hard. But remember, you're not getting involved for yourself. You're getting involved to make it a better place for everyone else. You're there to help everyone else. Don't go in as a self-serving position. You're going in as a position to serve everyone else. 